Hi, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, you know, glad everybody to see everybody here. Uh, we're going to do our Path to 250 webinar, uh, which is kind of a quick summary of first day for the US Link Step One. Uh, my name is Tao Lee. Uh, I will be your uh, primary host and presenter tonight. Uh, I am an associate clinical professor of allergy immunology at the University of Louisville, but you may uh, know me better as the senior editor for the first day for the uh, board series, as well as the chief education officer for US Link RX and Scholar X, and we'll certainly have a chance to talk about all that stuff tonight. So, you know, this is the first word in first aid. It's relax, you know, and, and really it's, it, it means to, you know, have us be more deliberate about, you know, how we, uh, um, uh, you know, prepare and so forth. And you do it right, uh, you will, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you'll give yourself the best chance, you know, of doing well on the US Wing Step 1 and the future US Wing exams. So, you know, in the next hour or so, we're going to, you know, take you through the basics, help you define goals. We'll also talk about a number of US Wing updates, uh, timelines for studying, approaching subjects, uh, prepping for uh, various, uh, you know, you know how, to, how to choose prep resources, some study advice, uh, talk more about ARCS Bricks and ARCS Coach and, and some of other things. And then we will have a raffle and special offer at the very end. So you stick around, you can... Uh, get a very special, uh, um, uh, you know, you can be put in the raffle for a, a very special deal that includes RX360 and, you know, up to five coaching sessions uh, with RX coaches, including Sean and or Alec and our others. Uh, and at the very end, we'll open it up for Q&A. And also we'll have a special offer as well too, uh, just for you, just for the holidays. All righty, uh, let me actually just get my pen up. Be easier for you to use. Okay, great. All right, let's keep going. So we're going to start off with a question. Uh, I want to learn more about who's out there tonight. So I'm going to um, drop into um, our polls and ask the question. I'm going to launch, and uh, I want to know who's out there. So uh, you know, just uh, you know, on the device. Uh, you know, uh, you know, choose a single best answer, and it'll take a couple of seconds uh, for the system to uh, tabulate it. And then I'll be able to share all the responses. We're up to about 30% responding, so go ahead and, you know, answer right away. And then, uh, And then we're up to about 60%. So I'll open it up for a couple more seconds. All right, looks like most people have answered. I've got 70% response rate, so that's good. I'm going to close it. I'll share it. And what we see here is uh, the, the, the big majority of the folks out here are international medical graduates. We also have a number of US medical students as well, too. So welcome, everybody. And uh, I am then going to uh, ask another question, which is, when do you plan on taking the US Wing Step 1? So is it really soon or in 2022 or beyond? So again, uh, I will open this up for a good uh, 20, 30 seconds and we'll tabulate. All right, so we are at around 70% response rate. So I will go ahead and close that and share. And what you see is that uh, uh, looks like uh, there's a spike. There's a large group of you that will be taking it in April, May, June, that makes sense. Uh, that will put you in time sync, you know, with uh, with applications, whether you're a U.S. student or international medical graduate. Uh, and then the and the rest of you folks are spread throughout the rest of the year, including a good 17% that it will do in 2022 and beyond. Uh, so uh, really, some long-term planners in there. So that's fantastic. Uh, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, you know hide that poll and then get back here. So let's talk about the US only uh, step one uh, first. This is a uh, one day exam here, uh, eight hours in total, and there are 280 questions in those seven one hour blocks. So 40 questions per block, and you're guaranteed a, 40, uh, uh, um, a minimum of 45 minutes of break time. Uh, so here's a very simple schematic that, that, that illustrates that. Uh, there is a, uh, um, uh, a, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, an orientation session at the very beginning. And actually, if you just go into that orientation session just to adjust your headset, 
and 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 do that you know uh, you know uh, do that beforehand actually because you can download the software directly from uslearning.org. Uh, then you can get close to 15 minutes of additional time. So you know so many of you should be able to get to close to 60 minutes you know just by you know uh, uh, you know essentially skipping that uh, block or or just using it to again set your headset. Uh, um, for the uh, uh, for for the audio or the multimedia, you know, uh, um, um, questions. And as you can see, here's the schematic for the other seven blocks. Somewhere in the middle, you're going to take snacks and food breaks and so forth. So that's 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 a simple uh, overview. Uh, in terms of the types of questions that are on it on it, it's it's really down to one uh, single best answer. Uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, 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 there, there are some multimedia questions, but not too much. Most of the questions are case-based, and you know, uh, and most of them, uh, and it's closer, you know, 85 to 95 percent of the questions are case-based. And um, you'll, uh, you'll also notice that there are multiple step questions as well too. So, what do you mean by multiple, multi-step or multi-step reasoning questions? This is where they integrate multiple related concepts together to create a more complex questions. Something that might actually show up when you're actually in the clinic. So here's a, a, a simple uh, you know, uh, uh, example of a multi-step question. So a 32-year-old Caucasian woman presents with a five-day history of occasional uh, double vision uh, and bilateral ptosis. And uh, they ask, what is the most appropriate diagnostic test? So right away, you're, 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 you realize that they're not asking for the diagnosis, which is what you would expect, right? Given that you're given, uh, you're starting off with this uh, clinical uh, presentation. So right, so that's step one is diagnosis. Number two, uh, um, you know, then once you figure out what the most likely -like diagnosis is, then you can uh, start to think about what is that, you know, what 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 would be the right diagnosis to take to make that diagnosis. So in this particular case with this Caucasian woman, five day history of Double vision is with symmetric findings and affecting the eyes. You know, uh, you know the most likely you know diagnosis here is going to be myasthenia gravis. Uh, you know, you could also uh, you know argue that this could be uh, multiple sclerosis, but they tend to have more unilateral uh, uh, findings. But again, being this being uh, myasthenia gravis, the most appropriate diagnostic test today in the United States. Would probably be the uh, anti-acetylcholinesterase antibody assays internationally and and you know classically you know in, in the older days you would also potentially uh, uh, you know order uh, the tensilon tests which is uh, you know edrophonium which is a short-acting acetylcholinesterase inhibitor so again this this uh, illustrates uh, you know very clearly how a clinical case can then uh, um, lead to uh, you know uh, um, a, a diagnostic that's re related to the underlying pharmacology uh, and you know you know how those uh, acetyl uh, uh, the uh, uh, acetylcholine receptors work. All right, so on the US MLA, they tend to have a very simple interface. You can see here that uh, you know here's the um, the case or what's called the lead-in, right? Uh, and then, uh, and then there's the actual question itself, and uh, the um, uh, uh, which is uh, I'm sorry, this is the stem. The case is the stem, and then the question itself is the lead-in. And then you're going to have you know four to seven you know choices, right? And then about 15 to 20 percent of the time, uh, uh, um, you can um, also uh, get a uh, some clinical. Uh, uh, um, imaging or diagnostic imaging or uh, or a diagram. Okay, you've got your navigation across the top and the bottom, uh, and then you have your all important timer here as well too. And, and then uh, uh, and then of course you can lock the exam uh, if you need to go use the restroom. But remember that the timer is still uh, uh, running. And then when you end the block, uh, then your uh, your uh, uh, then you can move on to the next block. Now, just keep in mind while you're in, while you're within the block, you can go back and change, look and change any of the answers to any of these questions. But as soon as you, you know, click, you know, this button, and you're done, you cannot return to any of those questions. You have to move on to the next block. 
The other thing to keep in mind is that if you if you have any time remaining in the block timer, it's still uh, you still have access to that as part of the uh, 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 part of the all day timer. So you should you should this would actually just roll over into your breaks. Okay. All right. So let's talk about you know scoring and passing. So on the USMLA, uh, um, passing is at 194. Uh, the theoretical maximum is about 300. The mean has been hovering at 229, 230, uh, and the standard deviation is about 20. Uh, if you are a U.S. medical student, uh, you know, um, you're, you're, you know, whether you're osteopathic or allopathic, uh, you're, you're essentially going to pass the exam within three tries. If you're an international medical graduate, whether you are born in the United States or you were born internationally, your chances of uh, passing the uh, usually step one is greater than 90% within two tries. But on the first try, it hovers in the high 70s, low 80s, uh, depending. But again, uh, within the three tries, it should be above 90%. All right, so you know, just some stats here so you, you, you understand the context. All right, uh, this is some data with regards to percentiles. Uh, the uh, um, uh, the uh, the minimal passing score uh, uh, you know is 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 roughly at the as you can see here the fifth percentile uh, the at the fiftieth percentile you're going to get around your two thirty and then at your two fifty score right you know the uh, uh, you know that roughly puts you at you know eighty fifth percentile right so one standard deviation above the mean okay. Uh, this ships, you know, every so often very subtly, uh, so you'll have to see they have updated, them, but, but this was updated as uh, pretty recently. Uh, let's talk about defining your goals. So in first aid, we like to keep things uh, pretty simple. We talk about just passing the exam, so 210 to uh, 229, uh, beating the exam, which would be, you know, hitting the mean or do, going above, and then acing the exam, which would be a r roughly one standard deviation above the mean. And again, as you're aware, because the USMLA is used, you know, for better or worse, uh, you know, as a as a screening tool for for competitive residencies, uh, you need to keep this in mind, you know, when when setting your uh, goals. Uh, so that you know, so uh, so if you are thinking about some of these very competitive specialties here, uh, aesthetic, you know, as you know, I'm just using for plastics, you may consider, you know, trying to get a 250 or higher. Okay. All right, so with that, I'm going to just make some updates about the US only step one. And I'm not going to read this all to you because you've seen a lot of this before, and th th these slides will be available to you later. But you know, as you're already aware, the US only is going to go pass fail, uh, you know, and it is on track to be implemented uh, in January 2022, so a little over a year from now. Uh, as you also understand, the CS exam will be coming back, uh, and uh, you know, uh, and we, uh, we, we think it's gonna come back sometime next year. We just don't know exactly when and, and, and what and how it's gonna look. The, uh, um, the USMLA blueprint itself is changing. And so for step one, uh, the key thing is that, um, uh, you know, there's gonna be a lot of more uh, items assessing communication skills uh, and they should be layering in you know, uh, they actually should have been layering in over the last month or so. And as a matter of fact, we have actually launched our new communications questions uh, on US Liner X. If you get into it, you can see it's right here. There's a group of about 30 of them. And they're gonna be, we're gonna be adding dozens more in the coming weeks. So these will certainly help you with uh, communications. So you're welcome. And then, uh, there's also going to be some changes to pharmacology. The big thing is that uh, while uh, um, you know pharmacology will still be tested with regards to mechanism actions, they're moving a lot of the pharmacotherapy to the step two. So in other words, you won't really be you will not be required to identify in general specific medications indicated for a specific condition. Now they will still ask about mechanism, potentially side effects, but generally not about treatment. That's going to move to the step two CK. Uh, and then there are also going to be potentially be some score delays as well, too. Uh, so they're just giving you a heads up of that. So I, uh, again, this, uh, this, is, uh, this information is available at the USLA.org website. All right. 
So, you know, when it comes to, again, you know, your, your board scores and how it relates to, you know, uh, where people match, as you can see here, uh, at least for U.S. knuckle students, there is a correlation, right? Uh, so on the right side, where there are the more competitive specialties, uh, like diagnostic radiology, ophthalmology, dermatology, plastics, you can see that people in general have higher board scores. So, you know, in the 240s uh, and, and, and approaching 250 in terms of medians. OK, uh, you know, but that being said, uh, you know, if you're a U.S. medical student, uh, this may come as some, you know, some comfort, which is as long if you're interested in a, uh, um, a uh, you know, non-competitive, especially like internal medicine, which is what I did. And my wife did pediatrics. Uh, you know, even if you do poorly and worse or fail, uh, you know, let's say this, you know, quintile here, uh, you know, this decile is you know is obviously in the failing ring you still had a high probability of matching into a specialty if you are a u.s senior going into something that's very competitive like otolaryngology which is what my brother did or you're an img there is you know you're, you're, you're probably does drop uh, this is a very old slide so the numbers don't really line up anymore and they don't publish this anymore but i, I still show this just to demonstrate the dynamics all right great so I threw a lot of information at you guys, and so I'm going to take a pause here, and I want to hear from you folks and hear what kind of you know scores you know, you're interested in, you know, for the USLA Step One. So I'm going to launch a poll. I'm going to ask whether you want to pass comfortably, you want to beat the average, or you want to ace the exam, right? So there is no wrong answer. You know, I mean, obviously any answer where you're passing is obviously the minimum, but for some of you, you may uh, want to do better. So I want to I want to kind of see you know where, where you guys all uh, fall out. So I'm going to again wait for another 20 or 30 seconds uh, and, and try to get uh, you know a, a 60 to 70 percent response right here. Okay, we are close to 70 percent. I'm going to go ahead and close this and then share here. And what you see is you know is that you guys are a very ambitious bunch. Uh, close to two thirds, more than well, more than half of you want to ace the exam. A third want to beat the average, and five one percent pass comfortably, which is completely valid. There is no wrong answer. You have to do you, right? Uh, so you know that, that's what this talk is all about: helping you uh, identify where where you want to go, and then hopefully guiding you there. All right, let's get back to the presentation. Uh, so uh, uh, we're going to go uh, next and uh, talk about timelines for studying. So first day, we'd like to keep it to two, uh, you know, uh, um, we'd like, like to keep it simple. Uh, we talk about the just pass schedule. Uh, this is one to two months of dedicated time uh, or, or, or uh, you know, um, that's, you know, combined or with a little bit of class. Um, if you're an IMG, you may be graduated already, so you may have more flexibility. But anyway, with the just pass schedule, uh, you know, uh, uh, we are we are a little biased. We think first aid is obviously a, a great way of doing this, and then um, of organizing your study, and then supplementing with crammable subjects. We'll talk about what those are later, and doing two question banks. And I'll talk about why you know um, why it's advisable to do multiple question banks and not just one. We'll talk about that evidence later. If you need to do better, if you need to get a better score, or also if you know if if, if you have if you uh, traditionally struggle with um, um, multiple choice exam, you may want to take a more extended schedule, so multiple months. And so it could be all of the above. It could involve the less crammable subjects, and then two or three question banks. So we'll talk about you know why that is later when we talk about the. Uh, the, the 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 research evidence behind that okay all right uh then you have to think about your study strategies uh so you know you know everybody has their learning preferences now there's while no learning style is technically superior to another one you know what you're most com comfortable doing right so you know so it's easier for you to kind of get into your groove uh with with how you know how you approach it now that being said you need to think about some other things like the structure and characters of the subject so, for example, you know, uh, you know, pharmacology, and microbiology, because there are regularly repeating concepts, you know, they they can be studied often in tables or flashcards. Uh, physiology tends to be more concept related, so maybe mind mapping 
or visual diagramming would be more helpful. Uh, you need to talk about, think about the strengths and weaknesses of your curriculum, right? So if microbiology is not well taught at your school or where you came from, you may need to get other resources. And then, and then time to assign to a particular subject or study uh, system, right? So if you're doing, uh, you know, neuroanatomy, you may only be able to dedicate one or two days of dedicated study, whereas with your doing pathology, that may be weeks, if not months. And so depending on what you do, you, you, uh, it, depending on the, the, the size and scope, you know, uh, you, may, you may be able to do more, you know, with more time in terms of other types of study strategies. So those are a couple of guidelines in terms of, you know, you know how, how you might set things up. All right. Uh, over the next five to 10 minutes, I'm just going to, um, you know, quickly go through what generally is considered high yield in all these disciplines. And remember, you know, even though we're, we're talking about as a discipline, it should apply across systems. If your if your if your curriculum, it, you know, it, you know, is organ systems, or you know, when you're doing your test prep, it is organ systems. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so I'll, I'll keep this at the high level. And again, just remember these slides are available at my blog at firstaidteam.com. I'll show you where to get a hold, you know, of a, a, a recent copy, so you don't have to uh, jot down as many notes. So, uh, and, and thematically, you'll 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 start to see a pattern as well too. So, one of the patterns is that you know uh, the things that tend to be high yield have some sort of clinical correlation, right? So, with anatomy, it's you know, What's the anatomy of specific conditions and, and or procedures and so forth, right? If you have a patient that presents to your emergency room with a spiral fracture of the humerus, then they may ask you about the, you know, the innervation or sensory or motor deficit in your hand, right? Because you might be severing a, a nerve or injuring a nerve that, you know, runs through the humor, humor groove that gets, uh, you know, disrupted by uh, that, uh, that fracture. Uh, you know, there are certain areas like neural anatomy, embryo, uh, that are classically high yield because, you know, they're fairly concise subject areas and, you know, they, they're, they're easily convertible to clinical vignettes that are relevant. And lastly, clinical imaging is very important because you're not going to really be seeing cadaver and you're going to be seeing like things like CT, MRs, all the clinical presentations. And so, yes, you'll see cross-sectional anatomy, but you'll see it as a CT or an MR. Uh, so be, be ready to, to, to identify clinical structures, both at the macroscopic and microscopic level. All right, biochemistry is one of those uh, crambled subjects, especially when it comes to metabolic pathways, uh, because, uh, you know, there's a number of repeating concepts with regard to, uh, you know, again, you know, you know, what goes into the pathway, what exits those pathways, the substrates, the regulatory enzymes, and the, the, and, and the genetic defects that can cause havoc with those pathways. So that's part of the uh, um, pathobiochemistry. And then you also need to think about, you know, uh, the laboratory techniques, you know, that, uh, um, that often get taught in this area, such as, you know, RT-PCR, flow cytometry, uh, ELISAs. And so, you know, it's you know, generally called lab medicine, but often it's kind of tied together with biochemistry uh, and, and see and understand how that can be apply in a lab or a clinical situation. Microbiology immunology is also crammable, again, because of repeatable concepts, right? Uh, such as, you know, the, the you know, such as, you know, how do you distinguish the, these, these microbes or, you know, uh, virions uh, from each other? Where do they go? How do they get there? How do you make the diagnostic test? Uh, you know, in a lab medicine way or uh, and, and also, you know, how do you treat it? You know, vectors, reservoirs, if that's, uh, you know, appropriate. Uh, uh, um, so keep, so, so that's why, it's, you know, crammable because of these recurrent concepts. Don't fixate on bacteriology because there's so much more to it. And, um, and on the, uh, you know, um, and, uh, immunology side, uh, Think again about how the immune system works clinically and how it gets manipulated by vaccine and how it is vulnerable uh, with certain conditions such as immunodeficiency. All right, uh, pathology, you know, I, I think comes as no surprise that this is, 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 is a large subject uh, area on the boards. Uh, so you're gonna have to do well in this, even if you're just trying to pass the exam because it's so much of the exam, right? Um, so. Uh, when it comes to the clinical conditions, the good news is that 
If it's a rare condition, they tend to stick with the hallmark characteristics. Uh, if it's a more common condition, then you know they'll show you more variations. And just remember that you know a lot of conditions can present like each other. You know, so uh, uh, but they will try to stick with something that's slightly more classic with rare conditions. Um, you will um, you will get from time to time clues you know, from the page about their age, sex, ethnicity, and activity. It may not be quote unquote classic or pathognomonic, but it can, but you know, it, it could help you narrow it down. Uh, it just, but just remember that, you, 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 you know, you should, you know, um, you know, you should, you know, psych yourself out sometimes because what is classic sometimes, you know, uh, you know, uh, should not lead you to exclude other presentation, right? So for example, you know, uh, you know, you know, sarcoidosis doesn't always present in, you know, black women. It can present in white males as well. So just keep that in mind. Uh, there are buzzwords, you know, that you learn about, you know, and, and you cram in first aid and so forth. But on the USMLA, they will give you the clinical descriptors or the, uh, or, or, or talk about it in a more neutral way. So you got to understand how those things present. The trigger words are just for, for you to help learn, but when you apply it, you need to know how it shows up neutrally. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, you know earlier, uh, you know 15 to 20 percent of the time, you're going to see these questions with uh, you know um, gross specimens, you know imaging, and so forth. The good news is a lot of times this can be answered from the history alone, uh, and you often don't need the image, uh, and you'll use that as a uh, as a confirm confirming aspect. And same goes with uh, the uh, uh, same goes with the uh, um, uh, multimedia as well too. So occasionally you'll get a hard sound, occasionally you'll get a long sound, or you'll see a, an unusual gait. Uh, but they tend to be pretty common things, uh, and a lot of times, again, the you can you can pick it up from from the actual case itself. All right, let's talk about pharmacology again. Cram level goal because, again, there are these repeatable elements that show up. What are the things that show up all the time, right? So uh, it's, it's mostly in mechanisms and toxicities these days. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, clinical treatment is going to be reduced and moved mostly to step 2 CK. Uh, um, you will want to make sure that you learn all the major variants in the, pro, uh, pro, you know, in the prototypical drugs, the classic versions. Uh, you know, if you're trying to get a high score, you'll, you'll go for all the minor derivatives, but in no case do you ever need to memorize the trade names or the dosages unless it's helpful, you know, as, an, as kind of a memory device, all right? Uh, and then uh, because, you know, this often, you know, impacts the system, you know, or it relates to a pathway or some genetics or whatever, then, you know, uh, then you need to often integrate it with the associated, you know, discipline like biochemistry, physiology, and micro. All right. All right. Physiology is also, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is concept oriented. Uh, so that's why, like, relational diagrams often help, you know, to help understand those basic relationships. Uh, you know, uh, physiology is often, you know, s uh, tied to pathophysiology. Uh, you know, almost almost blended that way. So think about, you know, how they could work together. Psychiatry, you know, it tends to be a mix of psychology, sociology, psychopharmacology. We often, we often obviously jump to the uh, uh, mood disorders as, as, as classic um, example psych, but, you know, but there are a number of other high yield areas like personality disorders and so forth, and they're all covered or at least touched upon in the uh, psych chapter. All right, public health, okay, uh, is a mix of biostats and uh, uh, epidemia ethics, uh, law, healthcare delivery, patient safety, quality improvement. Uh, these, uh, the quality improvement healthcare delivery was introduced several years ago. There is some, you know, uh, there have been some notes that some of this may move more to step two, but I think you'll still see some there. Uh, you are, uh, as I mentioned, going to see those patient communication patient uh, questions mostly about doctor-patient uh, interactions, okay? And uh, biostats and epi uh, tends to be also pretty high yield, uh, you know, just because they're, they're, they're pretty fixed. Okay, and then review resources. 
So, so I'll pause there, you know, just to just say that, you know, there, that was a lot. That was just a, you know, like I say, a, a 10 minute walk through that section, uh, you know, and again, you know, uh, I'll, you know, I'll make sure that you'll get access to our slides at firstdayteam.com if, if you need to get a copy. All right. Now, you know, how do you prepare for all this, right? So there's obviously a ton of resources out there, you know, text, textbooks like First Aid, test banks like, you know, Youth Liner X, you know, test review, case reviews, review courses, and all kinds of digital, you know, stuff out there, right, uh, that have online videos, flashcards, uh, you know, uh, you know in, in mobile apps, uh, you know, and so forth, right? So, you know, um, so with all that stuff out there, how do you pick and choose the right resources for you? So a couple of things to keep in mind. First, uh, we, we, we publish, you know, a uh, resource ratings in first aid, uh, and, you know, um, even if you're not using the latest version of first aid, you can come by our firstaid.com website and you can get those review resources at absolutely no cost. We run a national survey every year. Uh, we get feedback from students and IMGs about, med students and IMGs about what's high yield, and we bring that all to you. And we try to, we try to you know, um, uh, provide, you know, consumer guide type of ratings and, and for all those resources based on what our editors uh, recommend. But once you decide on using something, go ahead and start using early with your studies. You know, so the more, the more you can apply with your studies, the, 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 you know, the, the, the more you, you can sense of, you know, what's generally high yield. Uh, try not to overbuy and also realize that some series can be even, uh, uneven, whether it's a, a book series or a digital series of resources. All right. So I'm going to pause there and I'm going to, uh, again, you know, wake you guys up. I want to hear from you folks. I want to get a sense of what you think are the, um, the resources that you might uh, want to use out there. And let me open up the poll here. Uh, and so um, let's go ahead and launch that. So I want to know what resources are you use, all of the above or just one? So. This is a little different. You can choose multiple resources. So this will take you a little bit longer to answer. I'll give you guys eh, close to a minute here. So eh, about a third of you guys have answered. Um, there's plenty of resources out there. You know, what are you going to use? All right, close to half of the uh, have answered. All right, two thirds. All right, good. Looks like close to seventy percent. I think I can go ahead and close the poll and share the results here. And what you see is that almost everybody used QBanks, and then you know, uh, and then you know, uh, videos come next, and then review books, uh, and then a fair amount use flashcard and mobile apps. So uh, you know, so uh, uh, you know, so a big mix across QBanks videos and review books. Fantastic. There's no one right answer. And obviously, a lot of you guys are using all kinds of resources. All right, I'm going to hide that. And um, all right. All right, so let's get back to our presentation. Now, let's talk about just some study, just some uh, uh, study tips. And I'm going to certainly ask uh, Alec and, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, uh, Sean, you know, as our arts coaches, to share a little bit of their advice in just a bit, but these are some of the things that we've been hearing from students. And you know, and and when we and when we debrief students, you know, after they you know successfully you know uh, taken the boards, you know, we often get this type of advice. One is you know establish the study schedule and stick with it. Try to be disciplined. RX coaches can can absolutely help you with that, especially if you don't know where to start. Uh, uh, number two, you want to integrate and apply everything. So remember, it, it works really well, particularly for those multi-step questions. Uh, you want to save crammable subjects towards the end. So nobody wants to cram, but things like micro bugs, farm drugs, uh, some of those metabolic pathways, they may be a little bit more high yield at the end, right? Because sometimes you know, it's, it's powering through them or using you know, uh, mnemonic resources like Sketchy, this, that, and the other. Uh, um, and then you know being able, uh, and then being able to keep those in short-term memory. Uh, when you study, uh, focus on what you have learned in the past. 
uh, you know, before you focus on other quote unquote high yield stuff that you don't know. Um, you want to uh, make sure that you don't over schedule, right? So, you know, one of the ways you can stick with this schedule, you make sure you take time to you know, stay a human being, right? Uh, even if you are in your full out dedicated study period, I would highly recommend you take a day off to, 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 you know, to, um, uh, you know, do stuff, do laundry, be with friends, loved ones, whatnot, or just do light studying, right? Um, and, and even on heavy days, make sure you put in uh, plenty of breaks uh, and, and uh, you know, take opportunity for exercise and so forth. And then, um, you know, as we mentioned earlier, you want to stay relaxed and ground, be deliberate. We have a checklist that's at the front of the book uh, that will help you uh, stay on track. It's after all the acknowledgments, but right before uh, chapter one. All right. So, you know, that's some general advice. I'm going to ask uh, Sean and Alec whether they have any additional advice that they've been uh, giving to their students as an RX coach, uh, you know, uh, in terms of preparing. Absolutely. Well, Thank I you, Dr. Lee. Yeah, thank you. I you can know, go first. If you sure, want. go for it. Sure. So one of the big things that I talk to my students about is that it's important to have a schedule and a timeline of how you're going to study and to really make sure you take advantage of all the resources that you have. Um, doing questions is great, but you also want to be doing them with a purpose and doing the MBME practice exams that are available is a great way to do that. But not just doing those, but adding two blocks of 40 questions of Rx to it to really make it a full 280 questions because the first time you sit for 280 questions straight shouldn't be when you're sitting for your step one exam because if you look at the breakdown, the worst blocks people have are the last two. So that's something that you can really train yourself to be better at the last two blocks. And I think that's something a lot of people miss out on by just not taking the time to do the two blocks when they do their full lengths. Great. Yeah, that uh, was uh, yeah, that was great, Alec. Thank you so much. And as, as a part of our Rx coach, we actually will ask our students to take at least two assessments or do eight blocks a day at least two times before test day to make sure they have that stamina. Um, you know, one of the things we hear about a lot, and I'm sure Alec has heard this too, is you know, my friend said to do this, or my friend did this, or I read this online. And although they may be giving you great advice and maybe coming from a great and helpful place, just keep in mind that your friend, or your colleague, your classmate, the person who posted on the internet may not be like you. Every individual, even though if you're in the same class and you're close friends, will have different strengths and weaknesses. They'll have different ways of learning and different ways of applying what you learned. So just because something worked for your friend doesn't necessarily mean it will work for you. Uh, keep that in mind. And number two, you know, students are always a little afraid of taking assessments. They, I hear all the time, well, I'm not ready to take an assessment. Keep in mind that you don't have to be ready to take an assessment. You take the assessment to get ready for the test. And that assessment should be a tool that can help guide you and uh, help you do Alex suggests advice. Great, fantastic. All right, thanks guys, appreciate it. Um, so if you wanna hear more or learn more, then definitely, uh, 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 you know, again, check out RX Coaches and, uh, and we'll show you again, you know, uh, you know, you know uh, Jeff can drop a link about uh, getting access to a free consult with, with uh, Sean Alec or one of our other arts coaches. All right, so let's talk a little bit about self-testing and the computer testing here. So uh, it's called CBT, right? And that it, you know, it doesn't really mean anything other than computer-based testing. So as I mentioned earlier, there is a tutorial in you, you can download it. It's, it's really just an orientation module. It's the same 15 minute module that you'll get when you walk into the Prometric Testing Center. So do, do that first. And then, like I said, when you get into the testing center, it will essentially say 15 minutes, uh, and you know, uh, um, and you know, you'll learn that the, uh, that the, the the software has some functionality, including keyboard shortcuts that may help some some folks. And then, but the the, the bottom line was uh, self testing and so forth. This it's really important to do questions all the way throughout your studying, and and, uh, uh, and especially as you get towards the end. And there's a lot of science here, uh, including uh, you know papers published in the Journal of Science, oops. And uh, one of those papers was published about, you know, seven, eight years ago, uh, published in the New York Times. And what they saw was that when they randomized students to different uh, uh, types of uh, studying uh, and then test them later, uh, they found that uh, people who did, you know, self-testing, this is called retrieval practice. That's just fancy talk for, uh, 
uh, self-testing, they did better than people who just either just studied the subject once or repeated studying or did constant mapping. Now, all four groups had equal time. So it wasn't a matter of time, you know, uh, you know, so, but again, self-testing really forces you to recall, makes you practice it. And obviously when you're practicing recalling, you get better recalling, even if the questions are inference questions, you know, that are more complex. All right. So with the computer-based testing practice options, there's a couple of, you know, uh, you know, examples out there. Um, so, um, uh, you know, so uh, uh, there's the USMLE sample test. You got about 120 items that are useful for format familiarity. They did relatively well updates, so it gives you a, a decent sense of what's on the exam, uh, but obviously it's not enough. Then you have the NBME CBSSA. Those are the self-assessment that Sean was talking about, right? CBSSA stands for the Comprehensive Basics Science Self-Assessment. There's about six, seven versions of them. They're always adding new ones and retiring old ones. They're good for benchmarking. They cost anywhere between 50 bucks and 70 bucks. Uh, the more expensive versions can get you more, more information about the answers and so forth. Uh, but they all of them can, can give you some sort of prediction about how you might do on the USME step one. Uh, and so they're helpful that way. Uh, and then there are all the Q banks, including USARX and New World and stuff like that, right? So these are good for practice because they obviously have very deep explanations like we do. Uh, they're good for studying and for simulation. As Adam mentioned, you can actually take our USARX questions and create a full day simulation out of those questions. Of course, we also have two dedicated self-assessments as well too, uh, you know, that, that, that you can use. Uh, but, you know, we give you more flexibility with regards to being able to use your main QBank for uh, all day simulation, especially if you're trying to, you know, build up your stamina and, 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 uh, and, and, and understand when your energy level is not as good. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the research. So you heard a little bit about the research earlier about why you should do more questions, but have they understood more about, you know, how and when and how many questions, right? So it turns out there are some, you know, more uh, research out there. So there have been a number of studies, you know, including one major one out of Washington University of St. Louis several years ago that shows that doing QBanks is more, you know, question per question, more effective than flashcards, right? Uh, that's not any surprise, right? Because QBank questions tend to be, they tend to look more like real US-20 questions than flashcards, right? So that's, that's one thing to think about. Uh, the, an, another question that, that has been asked is, well, how, you know, how, how many, how many questions do you have, how many review questions do you have to do better? And it turns out it's going to be anywhere between 300 and 450 questions of a QBank will help you get, you know, perhaps an, another point on the uh, step one. Uh, and then uh, another question is how many questions do you have to do for best performance? And, you know, we don't know what the actual ceiling is, but out of University of Michigan, a study was done a couple of years ago where, you know, in that, in, in, in that particular cohort, students who did more than 3,200, you know, uh, board style questions did better than uh, other folks who did not. Now, they didn't have a group that was 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. So we don't know where the ceiling is, but we imagine, you know, it can be, you know, certainly uh, well above that 3,200 threshold. Um, we just don't know yet. Uh, and then, uh, and then, what about you know repeating MCQs, right? Because some people will say, well, just do this question bank three times, you're done. Turns out that that actually doesn't seem to work as well. Uh, basically, you know, it's actually doing unique MCQs. So, you know, you need to not see that question before, right? If you've seen that question before, you know, you you actually have the drop on the question, and uh, uh, you know, and uh, you can often get the question right just because of the familiarity because you kind of saw that scenario, not because you actually knew how to apply it, right? So, so in fact, in the University of Michigan study, the, the students who did best didn't do 3,200 uh, 3, questions that were repeated. All these questions had to be unique questions. And then lastly, uh, no surprise, but we didn't do the study, students who did first aid more than three times did better than did not. So, as a, so, for example, students are using our first aid flashbacks flashcards because it's all geared to first aid and it, and it gives you, you know, a space for a petition gets first aid. You know, that, you know, that's been, you know, that can help in, improve your step one score 
because you know uh, of the multiple passes. All right, um, we'll talk about you know some uh, so so that's a uh, that's that, that's some research there. So let's talk about some test day uh, uh, tips here. Uh, so um, uh, you know uh, you know a couple of things to keep in mind. You know you're going to be very you know you're going to be very excited on that day for a lot of you. So make sure you uh, you know uh, monitor your stimulant intake. Uh, you're going to be in an office setting uh, for the most part. You know, you know, obviously things are a little dicey with the whole COVID thing, but most of the time you will be taking it at a prometric center. It's it's a typical office building, tends to run a little cold, but sometimes there could be you know hot, some hotness, especially if uh, if there's direct sunlight, and so forth. So just keep that in mind. Uh, uh, most of the questions uh, don't have super long stems, but occasionally it, it does. And you know, while there are several ways to approach uh, doing, doing uh, uh, you know, breaking down a question, and, and if you're interested in that, then again, please talk to our RX coaches. We can talk to you about you know techniques, and we do have a a webinar called Di you know uh, uh, dissecting US me style questions. Uh, you know, and one of those you know, and and, and one of our techniques is uh, looking at the lead-in you know pretty early on. Uh, you know, but you know, there's a couple more steps. So do come to either our webinar or talk to one of our ex coaches, uh, but that will help you even with long, with especially with long questions. Uh, in terms of managing the clock, there are 40 questions in a one hour block. That works out to 90 seconds per question. So one of the things you need to think about, you know, and, and, uh, and, and our ex coaches talk about this is, you know, committing to an answer, you know, within well before that 90 seconds, like by the time you get to 75 seconds, because what happens is if you can commit to an answer and you mark the ones that you're still not a little sure, but you think might be solvable, you, when you get through those 40 questions, uh, number one, you're not gonna leave any blank, right? Because there's no penalty for guessing. And then number two, uh, you'll have 10 to 15 minutes left. You can go back to maybe 10 to 12 questions and try to solve some of those questions if you, that you think are solvable, all right? Uh, we talked about, you know, uh, um, food. Uh, there is, uh, you know, again, you, you need to uh, think about when you want to take your your, your breaks and, and have food. You, know, you can go two or three blocks and take a break or go two blocks, take a break, two blocks, take a break, uh, get a snack or whatnot. Uh, and again, if you're trying to find out when you're, when you have optimal energy, you can uh, do a, you, you can go to RX question bank and, do, and set up a full day exam uh, that will help you. Uh, you know, find your weak spots or your, your the, the times in the day where you have low energy so you can schedule a break there. And lastly, there is something that we jokingly call the C reflex. This was something that we talked about, you know, in, in my study group when I went to med school, uh, which is at some level, occasionally you will run the questions that you don't know what the answer is. And it turns out, you know, that, you know, there are dozens of, you know, you know, Dozens of not dozen up on dozens of questions that can sometimes be put in as uh, you know um, experimental questions or uh, or, or questions that are that are meant to help you know validate the psychometrics of that particular version of the exam uh, and so you know they're not going to get graded right so if that question seems impossible you know keep your fingers crossed that it's just one of those experimental questions and then move on you know the key thing is half the time one of the key tricks is to be able to understand when a question is not solvable, save your time and move on to the next. And so we, we call it the C reflex, you know, pick a letter. And if you don't know what it is, use your, use your, use your guessing game, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, once you get down to a, a reasonable set of options, guess amongst it, you know, uh, and, and then move on. All right, great. So that was a, you know, a kind of a whirlwind tour through uh, um, you know, uh, you know how to prepare for the exam, and a lot of that is discussed in first aid. But again, if you, you know, if first aid is not enough, if you're looking for more guidance, uh, then you should absolutely consider, you know, taking checking out RX Coach, right? You know, it's by people who work on first aid, uh, so you can go to RX Coach, uh, RX uh, hyphen Coach dot com. Uh, you can learn about what we do, and you can sign up for a a free console, right? When you get there, uh, absolutely no charge. Be able to talk to one of our coaches, get some free advice, uh, and, and 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 learn whether we can help you further 
in terms of you know preparing for the US only COMLEX, step two CK, residency preparation, anything. All righty. And you know, uh, um, you know, we've gotten a lot of great feedback from students who've used it. They've they've gained anywhere between 40 to 70 points on the step one. Uh, you know, we have a, an assessment that allows you to kind of benchmark how you know where you're at. We can come up with a personal study plan that's tailored for your needs uh, and only your needs. We have this very highly you know uh, uh, tailored one-on-one uh, -on -one approach. All of our tutors go through extensive. Uh, training and they're all certified uh, and you also get uh, access to RX360, our question bank videos and so forth and then the RX bricks. Okay great and then uh, um, uh, you know uh, and then you can uh, go to RX Coach. Uh, you know in addition to RX Coach, you, uh, you know we are available in all these other areas Facebook, Twitter, our blog, firstaidteam.com, Instagram, YouTube. I think uh, uh, Jeff just dropped a link. So follow along us. That's where you're going to get. You're going to hear. You're going to get. You know the latest information about the USMLA, our advice about it, and then free stuff, and also all all the great deals that you can get as well too. So as a matter of fact, let me uh, um, uh, show the site. So here's firstaidteam.com. And so you can get some information here, uh, some free advice, bonus content uh, that includes, uh, um, uh, you know, a study planner. Uh, you know, that also includes uh, um, for IMGs uh, a resource about uh, how to prepare. Uh, so that's the what we call the Section One supplement here. You can click on that, and that gives you information about preparing for the USMLE if you're an IMG osteopathic medical student, podiatry student, so forth. Uh, so it's all, you know, uh, so there's variations. It's all geared for you. Um, and then uh, we do have, uh, um, uh, um, let's see, uh, you know, uh, you know our, our videos and resources and presentations. So you get the presentation here. You get information. You can, you know, click in to get our video. Uh, watch a video uh, recording in one of these talks, and also you know get get a PDF presentation as well too. All right, so that's first aid. Uh, the let me see the other thing uh, I'll mention are the bricks, um, and so uh, these bricks have been sorry uh, these bricks have been out for the past year. Uh, these are you know highly uh, um, uh, you know yeah, you know. Uh, you know, super high quality learning units that can help you pick up the basics, uh, you know, uh, especially if you're still going through medical school or if you've been out of medical school and you need to brush up, you can, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, study with these bricks. Uh, they are, you know, basically self-contained learning lessons uh, that can uh, essentially review the first couple of years of medical school or, or to learn for the first time. Uh, you can see that they have clinical cases, uh, you know, they have, um, you know, easy to follow narrative. Uh, it's very strongly well illustrated. You know, it's got lots of, you know, uh, ability to magnify. You can also quiz yourself. So you're trying to quiz yourself on the structure. Hey, is this the superior vena cava? No, it's the inferior vena cava. This is the right ventricle. Yes, it is. Uh, so this tends to be, this is a, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, great, uh, great, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, review. Uh, and you can use this, especially if you're if you're confused about a concept in first aid. You can go back to these bricks. We also have multimedia as well too. So you know, I don't know if it's coming across through the GoTo webinar, uh, but you can hear murmurs as well too. And then um, you know, at the very end uh, of the bricks. There's a high yield summary of what you should have taken away from it. There's practice questions. Uh, then there's you can review the learning objectives, and then you can go deeper. And then this is where I mentioned you can you know connect with first aid, right? So you know um, you know these things are all connected to other elite learning resource. You know uh, the, the virtual learn connected to first aid. So you want you know, want to get the high yield version. You can go here. You can annotate and and so forth, and uh, and, and and get the high yield facts with regards to heart murmurs. And then when you're ready, you can go back and then go back to the uh, um, uh, to the uh, to the brick. 
All right. And, uh, and somebody did ask a question about what's the best way you use a brick with less than six months of exam. I would, you know, like I'd say, you know, if you're if you're struggling with a particular first aid topic, then I would go back and look at the corresponding brick. Right. Very easy to do. Just use our search and then, you know, type in whatever topic that is and we'll be able to get you to that brick. Uh, you know, uh, so you can you, you can uh, review it and then go back to first aid. All righty. And then, you know, we've we've also, you know, made some other multimedia enhancements uh, uh, um, that, you know, helps with uh, uh, clinical, uh, um, you know, not just doing well on the boards, but, you know, clinically as well, too. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, so, for example, when you're going uh, learning about clinical imaging. Right. So, uh, you know, here's a, uh, um, you know, CT here. You can see that uh, um, you can see that's well labeled, but then when you hover over it, we provide shading of all the structures, right? So you can clearly see where the left lung is. You can clearly see where the pleural effusion is, right? But it gets even better once you, uh, you know, you can also zoom in, and you can also then switch on to the quiz, right? And then once you switch on the quiz, then you're given a basically a naked, naked extra. This is actually how you would see it, and they would say, hey, look, where's the pleural effusion? Is it here? No, it's the left lung, but here it is. Here's your pleural effusion, right? So you can, you know, uh, you can use this to quiz yourself on the pathology, and you do enough of these, you're going to be a you're going to be a crack radiologist by the time you get to your M3 year, uh, going through all these clin uh, clinically enhanced uh, images. So uh, you know, enjoy. We just literally launched that four or five days ago. We've already gotten a lot of great feedback from students and IMGs that have been using that. We certainly like to hear from you. You know, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you have a chance to use our bricks.